family. Oh, y'all are bright-eyed and bushy-tailed today. This is good. This is good. It has been so fun over the last couple of weeks to see so many faces we haven't seen before quarantine uh, back in the house. And so, number one, welcome home. For those of you who've been gone, it's so good to have you back. You have not been forgotten. We love you guys. And we also want to welcome all of our first-time visitors and our uh, guests here. We're just so thankful. There's so many of y'all here. Um, God is doing a great thing here. And our heart really is, man, to lead common people into uncommon life in Jesus. And so we're thankful that you feel comfortable enough to come here and just allow God to love you. Will you let God love you this morning? Because he's about to do that big time. It's going to happen. Um, so with the, the, with all of that said, I just have to give a quick shout out to Pastor Charles. He led our Grace Point students all the way up to Dallas for camp. And Camp is one thing, but it's a whole other thing when the Holy Spirit is free to move in that camp in the lives of our students. And they came back, including my daughter, uh, on fire and passionate about the things of God. These are teenagers. These are teenagers. And so we just praise God for a great youth pastor that isn't about cookies and punch and balloons, but you're really about making disciples. And there's really no biblical basis for youth ministry unless it's an older adult leading a younger person into the deeper understanding of what it means to know Jesus. So well done, Charles for your leadership. So we are in this series called Steadfast. Yeah, let's go in a clap. There was a clap. I was going to try to just lock it down, but they gave it to you, man. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Charles is a real gift to us, man. So we are in this series called Steadfast. It means really just looking at the Psalms and what does it mean to live the Psalms. And so let's go before the Lord in prayer and let's dedicate this time to him because he is going to speak in this hour. So Father, Lord, thank you for the spirit that is in this room. There's a spirit of eagerness and a spirit of expectation, and we bring it before you, and we say, God, have your way. Come, Holy Spirit, and testify to your word. Illuminate these passages in a way for each and every hearer and those who see the word of God today so that, Lord, not one of us would walk out ignorant of what it is that you came to do in and through us. So, Lord, have your way. In the name of Jesus, we all said together, amen, amen. So I'm a child of the 80s. And, uh, and so any children of the 80s in here? Really? I, I'm fastly becoming, I'm quickly becoming the oldest person in most rooms that I'm in, and I'm not comfortable with this. Um, well, I'm a child of the 80s, uh, 1980s, and uh, one of the things, if you remember, for the three people in here that were old enough to remember this time, um, in the 1980s, one of the best things to go to was not on Instagram. It was to go to the mall, okay? And for the millennial and Gen Z group in here, the mall was this place where they put a bunch of shops together, and you actually went, and you did not click buy now, and it showed up on your front doorstep. You had to physically go. But it was really a social place. And so as a teenager, my spot was North Star Mall over by the airport. That was, at the time, the new cool mall with the big boots outside. We just marveled at that. Um, I know we needed to get lives, but we thought it was cool. But anyway... At North Star Mall, I'll never forget, what we would do is we would meet every weekend, and I would get dropped off with my friends, and typically Roger Martin, not related to me, but he was one of my best friends, we would go to the mall. And so what we would do is we would go, we'd hit up Orange Julius, anybody remember that? Uh-huh, okay, uh-huh. Oh, you just didn't want to admit that you're a child of the 80, I get it. So we would hit up Orange Julius and maybe go by Hastings Records. And uh, for a record, that is a format in which you were able to listen to music on a piece of vinyl. Uh, it's so prehistoric, you know. And so it was like, uh, what is it, the Fred Flintstone, and you had the little bird, and we dropped it down, and it started playing the music. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, whatever. These jokes are really funny. You just don't get them. But then we would, like, get our clothes at Chess King. Anybody remember Chess King? It's where you got all your parachute pants. And if we were feeling a little frisky, we'd swing by Spencer's Gifts. <laughs> if you know, you know. But I'll never forget, there was this time where we're out and we're around the kiosks, you know, where they sell like sunglasses and all sorts of nonsense. But there was a group of people this one day, I'm not kidding, and they were all standing in a group quietly staring at something. Well, you know when someone stares, they're like, look up, and everybody looks up, you want to see. Well, that's kind of what happened. And so my friend Roger and I go over, and everybody's doing this, and they're looking at three or four picture frames or these posters in frames, and it was like this pixelated pattern. And then I'm like, what the heck are they doing, bro? He's like, I have no idea, you know? And so we're, we're standing there, we're trying to figure it out, and then all of a sudden a girl goes, oh, my gosh, 
I see the unicorn. And I'm like, what the heck is she talking about? You know? And I'm standing there with a mullet. I'm just painting the picture. It was like a set of Stranger Things, basically, is what this was. And I'm like, and then someone goes, oh, my gosh, I do, too. And I'm like, okay, is this a joke? Like, what is going? And, oh, I see it. I see it. And then other people are like, I don't see it at all. I was one of those. This is called a stereogram is what I'm describing. And these, these were a big deal in the 80s, right, Brandy? You were a material girl in the 80s, yeah. So, so here's the thing. So let's throw that up there. This is what we were looking at. And they were framed. to put it, if you stared long enough and you learned, it's, a, it's an art, to set your eyes in such a way over time, there is a 3D image that shows up in this picture. I promise you, this is not a joke. There is a dinosaur there. Yes, you got it. That is amazing. How many of y'all still can't see it whatsoever and you think I'm crazy? Yep, that's it. And that's why this is an amazing sermon illustration. Um, <laughs> if I can say so myself. Um, there's a dinosaur there. Isn't it interesting? You could look at this and you go, I can't see it. And then others, right off the bat, Jay, it's amazing. You're like, that's a, that's a dinosaur. You're like, no, it's not. Yeah, it's really there. The reason why I'm sharing this is because this is a picture of what we would call revelation. Everybody say revelation. The reason why I share that is because the definition of a revelation is a surprising and previously unknown fact, especially one that is made in a dramatic way. This is what a revelation actually is. And so the reason why I share this with you is because in Psalm 19, we're looking at David again. And David is writing this psalm in Psalm 19 where he's had a very similar situation take place. What I'm talking about is, is that there's this going to be this moment for revelation for David that is so profound and so deeply life-changing for him that he has to write down what he has seen, what he has experienced, and what he thinks God has shown him, and it's crazy. So basically, here's the setup. For whatever reason, David has gotten up before the sun. And before the sun, and maybe he's gotten up to watch the sunrise. I don't know, but I just imagine that he's laying in the cool grass in Jerusalem, and he's looking at the stars. And he's looking at the stars, appreciating them for what they are. He's seen them a thousand times before, just like we all have. But there's a moment in which, as he's looking at the stars, he goes, Oh, my gosh. Aha, I see it. There's something beyond what, I'm, what my eyes have always seen. I just saw patterns and constellations. But I see God. I see God, and this is revelatory. So in Psalm 19, the way the psalm opens up is the heavens proclaim the glory of God. And with the way that we read this, we think David is just going, hey, the heavens declare the glory of God. Da, 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 da. Like no passion. Are you kidding me? He's going, I see the unicorn. In this case, God, okay? He's like, don't you see it? So he's, the re he's inviting the reader of Psalm 19 into this revelation. And imagine the excitement of discovering a truth. You all, it was always there. You just didn't see it. This is what he's talking about. He goes, don't you see it? It's not just stars. It's not just a sunrise. I see God. And he goes, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. He's like, oh my gosh, every single day they actually speak. He's not being poetic. He's seeing what many people aren't normally able to see. They just see a pattern, a pixelated pattern on a poster. He goes, oh no, there's so much there that you're not seeing. It's revelation that's revealing this to him. He goes, every single day speaks. Night after night they make God known because I see him. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard, but yet their message has gone throughout all of the earth and their words to all the world. And God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. And the sun, it bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. And the sun rejoices like a great athlete eager to run a race. When was the last time you saw the sun coming up and went, that looks like an athlete eager to run the race. 
If the sun is up and it's peeking through my curtains, I have blackout curtains at my house, okay, to keep the light out. If I could see a sliver of light and I'm still in bed, I'm late for work. I'm not going, oh, he looks like an athlete, Rhett. No, I'm going, shoot, I'm going to be 10 minutes late. And I text Dwayne, I'm like, bro, I'm going to be 10 minutes late. But this is a proud, profound moment for David. Because he sees something for the first time that he has never seen before. And he's discovered something that I think God wants us to understand today. We were designed by God to experience revelation. We were designed by God to be in awe of God. God longs to reveal himself to us. We were designed to go. And so think about the moments that take your breath away. It could be the moment you see your baby smile for the first time. There's something profound about that where it just does something different to you. Or maybe it's a landscape or a sunset on the beach. It could be when you look at the Rocky Mountains. It could be a song, a line in a song that you just sang that seemed and hit you in a different way. You've gotten a glimpse of the kingdom of God. And these are the moments that make us go, oh, hold on. There's something more here. There's something more that I wasn't seeing before. Guys, I'm here to tell you. A large part of our experience in heaven is us going, no way. I'm serious. I mean, the way that the world describes heaven is so lame. Oh, I'm going to ride on a cloud, and I'm going to play the harp, and I'm just going to. Are you kidding me? That's called hell. (laughs) Heaven is not that. Heaven is going to be wave upon wave upon wave of revelation and us going, no way. And the only response that we'll be able to have is just to go, you're awesome. You're awesome for all of eternity. I know it hurts. I know it hurts when we lose somebody. But when somebody who knows the Lord goes to heaven and we know where they're at, they're just going, I pity you. I pity you. You don't know. I see God. I mean, it's just wave upon wave upon wave of his revelation, his endless beauty. He reveals more of the mysteries of himself. God, Scripture says that there is no end to him. So for all of eternity, we're going to be going, ah! And you're going to go, David, you remember you preached about that? And I'm like, I know, it's really happening. (laughs) All of eternity, revelation, upon revelation, upon revelation of us going no way. Now think about that. And David goes, well, my gosh, if I'm moved by the speech of the stars in the sky, and they don't say even a word, but I'm able to see the image of God, could it be the thing that I've been taught from the time I was born as a child, the word of God, have that same quality. You can see him connecting dots because at the beginning he goes, wow. But then he begins to think about the word of God. And then there's this moment where you see the revelation even go deeper down to the other side. He goes, oh my gosh, the Bible, God's word is not just this thing of do's and don'ts. It's something. He's like, guys, don't you see it? The Word of God has the same quality as a stereogram where once you meditate and you ponder and you look at it over time, you begin to see the image of God appear and you begin to get revelation and see things that you never saw before. How many of y'all have read a a Bible verse a thousand times, but then you read it that one time, it's as if you've never read it before and you go, ah, I never saw that before. That's the, that is, when we pray, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's these moments where there's a little tear between earth and heaven that God gives us a glimpse of what he wants to show us and what is awaiting us. God loves us, and he loves to reveal himself to us, and we were designed to be able to experience the revelation of God. So David goes, oh, my gosh, now that I'm looking at the word of God, I'm seeing. He's like, listen, don't you see it? The instructions of the Lord are perfect. They revive your soul. How many of you all need your soul revived this morning? Where you're like, man, I just need some sunshine there. He's saying you can get the revelation to the point in God's word. If you are willing to stare and meditate and consider and ponder, you will get revival in your soul. 
The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy. They make wise the simple. And basically what David is saying is the word of God is like a stereogram. And this revelation, he goes on to say, is that this revelation actually takes the complex things of God's word. And all of a sudden, it becomes simple. God is able to take the complex thing of his word and then make it easy to understand. He goes on to even say, he says, the commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. How many of y'all need joy today? Right? I need joy. Well, he says, when you take time to meditate, the revelation of God's word will bring joy to your life. The commands of the Lord are clear. They give insight for living. So for those of us who are going, David, I don't know how to take my next steps. There's some in here that are pondering divorce. And you're like, I think this is what I'm needing to do because we're no longer compatible or we learned over. And, and so you're pondering these things. What I would say is allow the revelation of God to give you insight to your life because you could be making a multi-generational mistake that your grandchildren will be paying for if you take that step. I'm just saying the Word of God wants to reveal insight for our sake so that we can experience more revelation of God. Reverence for the Lord is pure. It lasts forever. He goes on to say, guys, don't you see it? The laws of the Lord are true and they're pure, and each one is fair. Here's the thing. Our world looks at the Bible this way. The world looks at our Bible and says, old school, antiquated, narrow, dry, outdated, lame, not relevant. And I think what David is wanting to say to us is like, that's the way that they see it. They can't see what's really there. So it just looks like a pixelated pattern in the mall in 1987 with Bon Jovi in the background. That's all they see. But he goes, when you get a taste of what I'm talking about, you're going to have the realization that God's word is like gold. It is more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. He said, the word of God, once you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, is even sweeter than honey dripping from a comb. He's like, I see it. I'm telling you. You see dry, complicated rules of do's and don'ts. He's like, you're not looking just... Train your eyes to see what I am able to see, what God wants to reveal to each and every person in this room. And not only that, but when we receive this and the Lord's revelation is free to work and we meditate on his word, what happens is is they actually, we we do get warned for our benefit, for the sake of our protection, right? And it is a great reward who then take the revelation of God and then obey God what he reveals to us. So there's an ability, there's a way in which we can obey the Lord that honors him through the revelation going, this is your next step. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to change so you can get more of me. But here's the thing. David is not the only one that has this type of revelation. If you look over at Paul, Paul says in 2 Timothy, he says, what you don't understand. He's like, don't you see it? It's not just words. He said the word of God is actually God-breathed. It is useful for teaching, correcting, training, and righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped to do every good work. Not only were you designed to receive and experience the revelation of God, but you were designed for good things. You were designed for that. And the word of God positions us and teaches us and brings the revelation of God's heart to us so that we can fulfill God's callings and purposes for our lives. It's the word of God. And Paul is going, don't you see it? He's there. He's saying that all scripture is God breathed. Did you catch that? That's an interesting way to characterize something. In other words, what he's saying is these words on the screens, they look like they're in black and white, but he's saying if you understand what you're really looking at, they are alive. The Holy Spirit has empowered every syllable and every letter to be able to declare, and they're packed full of God-breathed revelation, insight, to the heart of God. You can experience the kingdom of God, and that's what he's saying. But then in Hebrews it says, for the word of God is alive. Go to that neck. There you go. And powerful. 
So this, he, it's, these words are breathing, and they're alive. And so when you open up the Word of God and understand what you're really holding and beholding, you'll read it in a different way. And they want to say something to you. They are sharper than a two-edged sword. The power of the Word of God has the ability, according to Scripture, to cut between your soul and your spirit between joint and marrow, and it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And this is what it says, nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. Did you know that you're accountable to God this morning? So maybe you're wondering, well, then, David, man, I thank you. Like, I've been kind of slacking and reading the word of God, and no, you're already missing it. You see, it's not about reading anything. Read, read what a Yahoo News. It, that, that, that's not what we're talking about. This is not a consumption of information. Going, yep, I agree, still true. No, there's something else taking place here. It's about revelation because we were designed to experience revelation. So what would keep somebody from experiencing revelation? Let me put it this way. What would keep a Christian from experiencing revelation from God if we were designed to receive it? What, what is it? What could it be? It's one word. Ignorance. Ignorance is what will keep us from experiencing the revelation of God. Now, listen, I know in 2021 when we go, oh, that person's ignorant. What we really mean is that they're stupid. That's what we're really trying to say. But if you look at the actual definition of ignorance, it's, it's not what we think it is. And so I'm not here to insult you this morning. The definition of ignorance is simply Lacking knowledge or awareness in general, uneducated. You see, if we're not pursuing the revelation of God, what is going to happen is we will live in ignorance. So it's one or the other. So either we're walking in greater revelation of God through his word, through his Holy Spirit, and all these other means, or we're actually going the other direction, walking in ignorance. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So another 80s reference. So there you go. But back in the 80s, especially in the early 80s, do y'all remember the con- those conversion vans? Do you know what I'm talking about? A conversion van, basically, back in the day, if you had one of those, you were living large. Okay? That was the pinnacle of success. So if you went down and got a Ford or a Chevy van, basically what they would do is they would shove an entire living room in the back of a van. And there was lots of fabric. I remember lots of fabric, lots of uh, velour, right? Remember that, <laughs> right? And a, a, a beta VCR, Betamax, right in there. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Yet again, another format that no one's familiar with. Um, and they were really, really cool. And I remember I had a friend who had one. And man, they were just the coolest kid on the block because he had a conversion van. Well, What's so funny now is that same van, if you see one on the road, that's the van we tell our kids to stay away from, to not take candy from, right? But at the time, they were legit, and they were the pinnacle of success. And so this is a true story. In San Antonio, back in the early 80s, I remember my dad sharing this story. There was a guy that went to a car dealership. He paid cash for one of these conversion vans, so he's successful. So he's smart enough to do things enough to where he could buy a conversion van and pay cash for it. Pretty, pretty impressive. And Dave Ramsey would go, great job, right? So he buys, I'm just tossing pearls to swine this morning, y'all. So <laughs> he, he buys the van. He gets on 410, okay, here in San Antonio, gets it up to 60, 65 miles an hour, puts it on cruise control, because it's loaded. This baby is loaded, bells and whistles. Puts it on cruise control, gets up from his chair out of the driver's seat, goes to the back, opens up the fridge, starts making himself a little drink. No one's in the driver's seat, guys. Needless to say, the van wrecks. He totals it. It flies right off a 410, and the dude lives to tell about it. Now, I don't know if that's a blessing or not, because now he's got to live the rest of his life as the dude that put cruise control on thinking it was autopilot, right? He's got to explain that. Watch him be here today. He's like, oh, that's me, you know. (laughs) 35 years later, I'm still trying to live this down. But here's the reason why I I was sharing the story with Sarah, and we were kind of laughing. And I know we shouldn't be laughing, but it is kind of funny to think that he thought that this thing... The only thing that we can figure is that the salesperson probably said, man, this thing could drive itself, practically. And the guy took him literally. But here's the irony of the whole thing. 
in the glove box was an owner's manual. And all he had to do is take four minutes to verify this feature. Why do I share that story with you? Number one, because it's hilarious. But the second reason why I share the story with you is because ignorance isn't another word for stupid. However, ignorance can make you do stupid things. Ignorance is not just going to put us in a situation to where we do dumb things. Ignorance is dangerous on any level in any context. Ignorance, people do things in the name of God and quote God from a place of ignorance, and they have no idea what they're talking about. Those people are dangerous. And some of you, you have not gone to church for years because people in their ignorance did things in the name of God that were destructive and harmful to you. This is a big deal. Ignorance is dangerous. And Paul goes on to explain, though, that for a Christian, for us to walk in ignorance instead of pursuing the revelation of God through these means in which he's communicating to us is a very dangerous thing because he says, if you walk in willful spiritual ignorance and you don't do anything to respond to like even a sermon today, He says, your heart will become darkened. Your understanding, you will be separated from the life of God because of the what? What does it say? Because of the what? That is a sobering statement. That is doing them due to the hardening of their hearts. And so what scripture is saying, that when God reveals a truth in his word, and sometimes we don't like what we see, let's be honest. I don't want to stop that. I don't want to change that behavior. I don't like that rule. That seems very good, very hardcore. It seems, and so we start stiff-arming the revelation of God. And what Scripture is saying, when we do that, not only are we seeding ignorance within our spirits, but we are actually putting ourselves in a position to where our hearts become brittle and hard. So when God does try to speak to us, we can't even receive or hear it. We have stiff-armed revelation to where now we are bound in ignorance. Does anybody want to be bound in ignorance? You see, here's the byproduct of this. He goes on to say, when we stiff-arm God's revelation through his word, and we don't receive it, we don't ponder it, we don't say yes to it, what happens is he goes on to explain that these people who walk in spiritual ignorance willingly will have lost all of their sensitivity to the things of God, and they will give themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. So there seems to be that when a Christian who claims to be one does not receive the revelation of God through his word and allow him to show us things that we don't know about, When we stiff arm him, what takes place is it seems that there's a disproportionate perversion that shows up in our lives to where we come over and hypersexualized and we become very tight fisted with the things that God gives us. We become greedy perverts, is what scripture is actually kind of saying. Over a period of time, someone's heart can become like that. Someone who claims to know God. These are the people that want the benefits of the kingdom, but they don't want the king telling them what to do. The problem is, guys, and I hope that there's nothing but love being reflected up here because I'm saying this because you you need a pastor that will tell you these things. I want what's best for you. I'm I'm not celebrating myself. I'm just simply saying I love you so much, and I want you to know the real deal, man. You see, Scripture says that we, each and every one of us in here, will stand before God at the end of our lives. And we will have to give an account. And Scripture is about to show us that we can't claim ignorance as an excuse for why we didn't honor and obey and avail ourselves to the revelation of God. Scripture says that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. Look at what, how they're described, though. They suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them. And yet, because God made it plain to them is why it was so simple for them to see. But in other words, Scripture saying God's not wanting to play hide-and-go-seek with you this morning. He wants to reveal himself in such a way that is plain and simple so you can go, oh, I see it. 
I see it. And then you point others to be able to, no, 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 look, look, look. Look, you see it, yes. This is why God wants to do this. Why? Because we were made for revelation. He longs to reveal his love to you guys. He longs to reveal truth to you. He longs to give you life so that every person who's ever taken a breath would know that he's real and that he loves them and that he pursues and longs to leave the 99 to go find the one who's lost. This is God, guys. And Revelation reveals this to us. He's not one to pull the one out back front into the 99 so he can beat him up. It's like, no, I want to show you some stuff. I want you to go, you got to be kidding me. Kingdom come, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It says in Scripture, for since the days of the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities and his power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. There's no reason why not one person in here can't walk in greater revelation of God is what Scripture's saying right here. If you need to find it, look at a tree. Stare at it long enough, you'll begin to see God in it. Look at the stars. Look at his word. Look at yourself in the mirror and be amazed and see the image of God. You matter. You see, no one's going to have an excuse, though, when we stand before God and give an account for why they didn't accept the revelation of Jesus. This is what God is saying to us. And so David is now pressing further into this revelation because as he goes deeper and deeper into the mysteries of God, he begins to realize something. When we read the word of God, not only do we, do we see and learn about God, but when we read the word of God, something happens to where the word of God begins to read us. Y'all follow me on that? You're like, that sounds really hippy-dippy Zen talk. No, 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 check it out. You see, the Word of God gives revelation to, about ourselves. So as David begins to consider this, he goes, oh, my gosh. The more I see of God, the more he reveals about myself. And then this is what he says. He goes, oh, my gosh, how can I know all of the sins lurking in my heart? He's like, I don't even see what I, oh, my gosh, how can I possibly know? And then he goes, would you please cleanse me from these hidden faults, whatever they are? But in this revelation, David says, God, there's so much in me that I don't even see. I'm so ignorant of the things that are in me that I'm not even But here's what I will say. God, would you please keep your servant from deliberate sins? Can we go to there? We go. Deliberate sins. He says, please don't let them control me. Is it raining? Come on, Lord. Let it rain, pour out the floodgates of heaven. Come on, man. But he's saying, listen, Lord, don't let your servant commit these deliberate sins. He says, and don't let them control me. He says, but then I will be free and innocent of great sin. Paul, jumping back over, who's got the same revelation, he goes, Timothy, remain faithful to the things you have been taught you know they are true, for you know that you can trust those who taught you. Allow the rain to soothe our spirits, but allow the water of the word to keep us focused, okay? He goes on to say, you have been taught by the Holy Scriptures from childhood. Can I be a preacher just a little bit more for one second? Some of us were raised better than the way that we're acting right now in our lives. Your mama raised you better. Your daddy taught you different, but you're making life choices because you're a grown adult that are in opposition to what you've been taught. And this is what he's saying here. We've been taught better. For those of us raised in church, I think that maybe could it be that we've allowed our hearts to become hardened, and now we're walking in ignorance. This is what he's saying, protect yourself from. You've been taught from the time that you were young. And all scripture, look at what he goes on to say. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong with our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong. That's what a good parent does. He says, hey, stop picking your nose. That's socially unacceptable. And when you see that person at the stoplight doing it as a grown adult, you go, someone never taught that person to do that, right? And to the nose pickers in the room, I'm sorry. But it corrects us when we're wrong, and God uses it to do something, though, to prepare us and to equip us for every good work. 
And so starting with me, guys, as I was writing out this sermon and finishing it yesterday afternoon, I just went, God, I'm ignorant. I feel so ignorant in so many ways and areas in my life. Can anybody relate to that? Where you go, how could I possibly know all the things in my heart that are just dumb and ignorant? What do we do? Is this a sermon to make us feel bad and beat ourselves up? No. Maybe if you and I were having coffee and you're like, okay, Dave, on the down low, I feel kind of ignorant too. I don't, I don't see God often in my life. I don't see God in his word. Actually, David, I rarely open up his word because I just, I'm not into it. it just, I get bored. I get sleepy. I don't understand it, so I don't. And, and if that's you, I understand that. But can I tell you something? God is not here to beat you up this morning. He's here to be gracious. And let me explain to you why. In Acts chapter 17, look what it says. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times. But now, everybody say, but now. He commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. How and why? Because he has revealed Jesus to us. We now see God in 3D. Jesus came so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. So that we could repent, meaning allowing God to change our mind through a moment of revelation where this new revelation of truth and fact enters into our hearts and we go, I see it now. But guys, you won't have that experience if all you do is just trust in me on a Sunday to tell you these things and it lasts for the week. God wants to talk to you. He wants to reveal himself to you. And he wants to do it in spades in this season, guys. I, I, I've, I, I, I can't tell you how I feel about the sermon. I'm so aware of that. For those who are thirsty and hungry and you're looking for the, is God real? Does he want to say something to me? Can he do something with me? Does he want to show me something? Yes, in Jesus' name. Yes, he does. He does. He does. I'm telling you, he does. So where do we start? Maybe you're going, David, I, I want to do that, but I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I'm going to put us on a 31-day Discovering God challenge, and here's how we're going to do it. It's going to be super simple. Grab a Bible or download the YouVersion Bible app. It is free, and there's literally 19 different translations in English that you can pull up and read. So here's what I'm going to challenge us to do as a church. I dare you to do this for 31 days and not get to the end of this 31 days and grab me in the lobby and go, David, my life has been transformed. I see it. You won't believe what God has shown me in this month's time. Guys, please take a screenshot of this screen right now and hold on to it and commit to it. Get a Bible or download the version of the, so here's what you do. Take one page of the Psalm. If you're doing it in the app, Read 15 to 20 verses of a psalm. I don't care. Just flip over to the psalms and read it. Then the cool thing about the Proverbs is that there's a chapter for every single day of the month. There's 31 chapters. Pick a chapter of Proverbs and read it. So read 15 to 20 verses of a psalm. Read one chapter of Proverbs and then simply make this prayer and pray for 15 minutes. This is it. God, reveal yourself to me. What do you want me to see here today and then begin to take note of what he begins to say. Would you stand to your feet? What's interesting is that David at the end of this chapter of revelation upon revelation upon revelation about himself, about the world and about God, this is what he says at the end. You ready? May the words of my mouth, Father, and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O oh Lord, my God and my Redeemer. He's saying, I don't have it all figured out. I'm still jacked up, but I can't unsee what I've seen. I can't untaste what I've tasted, and I want more and more and more. For some in this room right now, nobody leave, nobody get up. This we're about to do. We're about to baptize four people, um, so hang tight for that. Let's go in and get them ready. Let's go in and get those folks ready. Here's the thing. For you, maybe you're here and you're like the revelation that you've gotten today is you want. I want Jesus. 
Everybody just eyes on me. You want Jesus. God has revealed that to you. He has revealed Jesus in a way to you right now where you go, I want a relationship with God. But guess what? You would assume everybody would understand that. But scripture says in John 1, 9, the one who is true light, who gives light to everybody, Jesus was coming into the world and he came to his own people. And even what did they do? In ignorance, they rejected him. That's what scripture says. Their hearts were hard. So when the revelation of God was standing before them, they didn't recognize it and they rejected it. But to all who believed him, and accepted him. He gave them the right to become the children of God. And this is your moment right now. This is your moment. I'm only preaching it to the level I feel it. And I'm telling you, today is the day of your salvation. And Jesus has revealed himself to you. And so now it's time to receive that revelation by saying yes and thank you. Pray with me right now. Dear Jesus, I repent of my sins. Change my mind, change my life. I want to exchange my sin for your forgiveness. I want to exchange my life for your life. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead on the third day. And I'm asking you to save me, cleanse me, fill me with your Holy Spirit and I make you the Lord and boss of my life. Thank you for revealing yourself to me in Jesus' name. Here at Grace Point, because it is our mission to lead common people into uncommon life in Jesus, we celebrate those first steps. If you just prayed that prayer, the count of three, just put your hand up in the air. One, two, three, if you just prayed that right this morning. Let me see, yes, ma'am, who else, who else? Come on, put it up super high. Put it up super high, yes, yes. Anybody else? God is doing a new thing. He revealed himself to us. We got a glimpse of heaven today. We're about to get another glimpse and another revelation of what it means to see dead things come to life through our brothers and sisters about to step into the waters of baptism. And so let's continue to turn our attention over to here as we celebrate that. Okay, take it. So right here we have Divine. Divine's one story is this. I was struggling to find happiness in things I do. With Christ, now I'm learning to find my purpose, and this makes me happy. So divine, because of your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in death, raised to walk in the newness of life. Victor. Victor's one statement is this. I was once a lost man. Now I'm being led by faith. So Victor, because of your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in death. Raised to walk in the newness of life. Xavier. Xavier's one story 
I was baptized as a child, but later came to the understanding of sin, repentance, and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the role of the Holy Spirit. And now I am truly saved. So Xavier, it is our pleasure because of your public profession of faith to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in death, raised to walk in the newness of life. This is Xavier's brother, Isaac. This is Isaac's story. I was once a sinner, always letting Satan and his demons distract me in choices I made during my whole life and kept me from listening to God. Now I'm free from Satan and all of his demons because I believe in God and I truly believe that God is my Lord and Savior and I know that he truly loves me and I want to be freed from sin and a true follower of God. Isaac, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Bat buried with him in death, raised to walk in the newness of life. So if you knew what I knew, <laughs> you'd be freaking out like I'm freaking out. <sighs> Dead things come to life, guys. There's hope for you. There's hope for us. And each story is a story of redemption. This is what happens when we stop allowing the world to tell us what is true of God and we begin to allow the revelation of God to tell us otherwise. The Lord longs to reveal himself and we just saw four powerful, if you knew what I knew, four powerful pictures of that reality. God's got more. Can you believe it? There's more for you and there's more for us. And so in Jesus' name, just open your hands. And I'm just going to pray the next psalm over from Psalm 20. I just feel led to do that right now, and then we'll get out of here. Oh, come on. iPad. Can you pull up Psalm 20, sweetheart? I'm calling her sweetheart because she's my wife. Uh, just so it's for the new people here. You... She's got the version Bible app. Look how it serves us so well. Okay, Psalm 20, NLT. Yeah, you know me. There we go. In Jesus' name, in times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm, Grace Point. May he send help from his sanctuary and strengthen you from Jerusalem. And may he remember all of your gifts and look favorably on all of your burnt offerings. Oh, in Jesus' name, my sweet, sweet friends and family at Grace Point West, may he grant all of your heart's desires and make all your plans succeed. And may we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of our God, and may the Lord answer all of your prayers. This week, as you seek him diligently, faithfully, as we step into this 31-day Discovering God challenge. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Have a good week.